WestJet Pilots and other podcast listeners. So welcome to this edition of the WestJet Pilots podcast. My name is Desmond Jordan. I am the chair of the P2P committee and also the host today. I am joined, fortunately, by our MEC chair, Bern Lewell. How are you doing today, Bern? Good, Des. Here. Very well, thank you. And also our MEC vice chair, Chris Thal. I'm doing absolutely fantastic, if you're going to ask, Des. I was going to ask, and I'm happy you answered. And <laughs> also, and possibly most importantly, we're joined today by our Strike Committee Chair, Christina Thompson. Hey, Des. So today was the conclusion of our 13th annual regular meeting of the uh, MEC. And as you could probably imagine, uh, it was quite a busy session. Multiple things were discussed and uh, touched upon. We also uh, were fortunate enough to have some fairly high-ranking uh, uh, members of ALPA of the Alpha administration uh, here joining us in Calgary. Uh, Bernie, I was wondering if you might be able to just touch on uh, some of the issues that were discussed in the meeting as well as some of the uh, staff that joined us from Alpa. Yeah, it sure does. Uh, the first day of the meeting, it was a three-day meeting. The first day was really a committee reports and just getting um, the MEC updated on, on where our committees are standing. The second and third day were both executive session. Uh, we were discussing things more along uh, uh, the lines of what's what's going to be happening to us over the next three and four weeks. Uh, you mentioned a couple uh, important dignitaries, I guess we can call them, uh, that came up from Elk National. We have Tyler Hawkins, the newly elected uh, EVP of admin for uh, Elpa National. And we also had Wes Clapper, who is the EVP of finance for Elpa National. Uh, so Tyler Hawkins uh, gave us a briefing about the ramifications of strikes within uh, the Elpa's structure over the last 20 years. And, and what we can expect going forward here. Wes Clapper, the, again, the EVP of Finance, he uh, talked a little bit about the strike pay and, uh, and what we expect going forward with the financials. So you might remember two weeks ago, we announced the $2 million of funding, and that is US dollars of funding from the major contingency fund, otherwise known as the MCF, and that was allotted to our MEC uh, to fund three specific uh, areas within our MEC, and that is P2P, pilot to pilot, that's what you're in charge of, Des, as mm -hmm. you know, uh, the strike committee now, and uh, as well, family awareness. He gave us a brief rundown of where we're standing with the finances there, as well as uh, where the strike pay uh, is progressing through the council. Uh, do you have the ability to elaborate on what that strike pay might actually be? So there is a, a proposed amendment to the current uh, strike funding, and uh, that will be voted on by the executive board on the 17th of May. Uh, what is proposed and what will most likely pass is uh, some alterations to the existing, uh, existing um, formula. So uh, if it passes in the, in the form that it's being presented, uh, we will... Uh, receive $2,480 U.S. again, uh, as long as you have performed some sort of duty uh, uh, related to the strike with the uh, Westjet Master Executive Council. As well, that there is a 14-day withholding period. So the first 14 days, there's no monies attached to it, but once you hit the 14th day of a strike, you will be paid for those 14 days and then every two weeks thereafter. Okay, and that 14 days, that's a change in policy because it used to be 30 days, is that correct? So it is currently 35 days. So this amendment would change it from 35 days to 14 days. As well, currently it's $1,400 US a month, and that will change it to $2,480 US a month. Okay, so it's interesting. You mentioned uh, Wes Clapper and Tyler Hawkins. Those those gentlemen are both EVPs. I think it's important to mention that because that just highlights how important the goings on at WestJet are to uh, Alpa as an association. The fact that those they would send people of such high ranking positions up here to aid us and assist us directly in what's going on. All eyes currently at Alpa National are on WestJet at Master Executive Council. They want us to succeed in, in our goals. And we also had Ronan O'Donoghue, who is the uh, chair of the SBSC National, and David Campbell, who is our point of contact uh, for SBSC National. Both of those uh, gentlemen are Alaska pilots who uh, were instrumental in helping the Alaska pilots get the contract that they currently enjoy. So we're, we're just uh, ecstatic that, uh, that those two gentlemen are up here helping us uh, develop our strategy. Thanks, Bern. And uh, Chris, could you also just uh, give us a quick update of where things are at with you? 
Yeah, for sure, Des. You know, uh, apart from leading up to this MEC meeting, and as Bernie mentioned, doing a lot of these committee reports and gathering the committee reports, uh, apart from just strategizing everything that we got going on right now, we've been talking on these podcasts that we've been communicating with. Everything's kind of pointing to a strike, preparing for a strike, preparing for a contract. Meanwhile, there are so many committees that aren't involved in that at all. Uh, namely, you'd look at something like our Central Air Safety Committee right now. We just launched our cargo operation. There's many items we could get into depth with that, but those take a lot of time when something like this occurs within our airline and within our committee. So Central Air Safety, whether it's pilot recovery, pilot assistance, uh, you know, occupational health and safety, these are all full-time jobs for these committee chairs, and I'm still more or less in the background trying to manage all that while we continue working with someone like yourself, Des, and P2P. And for those of you who don't know, it is the uh, vice, MEC vice chair who is responsible for administering the committees within the association. And Christina, we all know that you've been very busy. Could you just expand on what's going on in your world? Thanks, Des. April 18th was a very momentous day for this pilot group. We received the results from the strike authorization ballot. Uh, and that was when we knew definitively that our pilot group was standing behind us with a 93% in favor of labor action uh, if it's required. So on that day, we also announced the opening of strike headquarters here in Calgary at the airport corporate center by the Delta, by the Calgary airport. We had the media there. And it also coincided with the day that the MEC definitively agreed to change the name of the Strategic Preparedness and Strike Committee to the Strike Committee. We've increased our ranks by the dozens of volunteers that are manning strike centers. The Calgary Strike Headquarters is officially up and operational. Toronto and Vancouver are being furnished as we speak, and the Wi-Fi and phone lines are getting set up, and both of those locations will be operational effective May 1st. All of those things are very important for having the strike center physically ready. Uh, we just had a fast read come up from the MEC recently, and the Strike QRH was also attached to that. Could you expand on that for us a bit, Christina? To the best of my knowledge, does this document is the first ever of its kind created in Alpa's history. And uh, the idea was thought of a long time before we even entered negotiations for CA2. Uh, we wanted to create a document, whether it was on paper or digital, to provide our pilots with an easy, simple to use method of understanding where they needed to be and what they were going to do in the event of possible labor action, strike and or lockout. And if you haven't had the opportunity to take a look at the strike QRH yet, um, I have to express my deepest gratitude to Captain Tom Lindstrom. Uh, he's been working on this document for a very, very long time. And now all of our pilots should have access to it in the event that we actually have to use it. Uh, I believe it is very straightforward if you are on a pairing, if you are at SIM, if you are on days off and there is anything that this union can do to help you, whether you need to be reaccommodated in a hotel or you need a flight back to your base, this is a way of us to track where all of our members are and accommodate them depending on their needs. It is an amazing document. It is full of uh, a ton of pertinent information. And I would say to uh, all of our pilots, now that it's been released, that we should uh, take the time now to familiarize ourselves with it so uh, we're ahead of the curve if we are actually in a position where we need to use it. I also have to say that many of our volunteers have been spending weeks and months answering darts with questions and concerns from our membership. And we intend always to answer everybody's questions and include those in the QRH, which is going to be your best source of information for what's going on. Having said that, we know that there's no possible way to answer all questions. So please keep submitting darts. That is the best way for us to get the information out that our members need. And remember, when you submit a dart, that information is taken, it's incorporated into future fast reads. It's, it's a great mechanism for the MEC to gain information so they can transmit it back to the pilot group. So yes, please do continue to submit those darts. 
And we do have a lot of questions coming in. We'll be touching on those a little bit later on in the podcast. But let's just uh, take stock of where we are in the negotiations process. Uh, We're all aware that we have concluded the conciliation process and we are in the cooling off period. Byrne, would you mind speaking a bit more to that? Sure, Des. Yeah, the conciliation period ended on the 24th of April. So the cooling off period, the 21-day cooling off period, started on the morning, I, I guess midnight 01, on the 25th of April. And that will go all the way until the 16th of May. Uh, and that is 0001 on the 16th of May. And that is the first time where we should be eligible to go on strike or enact work action, or to be fair, the company could lock us out. I think as a pilot group, we have a fulsome understanding of that idea of the process. I'm wondering though, what is your general feeling on how things are going at the table? To be fair, the company has been showing up at the table three or four days a week. I have committed our negotiators to the table five days a week, and I would be willing to to send them out for seven days a week if the company would reciprocate. Uh, We're at the point now, though, where we are getting into the final game. I need the company to put the resources into this negotiation that we require to get a deal. Definitely, Bernie. We are certainly going to need that level of commitment from all parties involved to come to a successful resolution. As I had mentioned previously, we have been getting numerous questions from the DART and the P2P system. So we'll just take this opportunity now to review some of those with uh, the panel that we have here and get some of the answers out to you our listener pilots. Uh, Here's one of the questions that came in. Can the 72 hour notice to strike be given in the 21 day cooling off period? What are the rules surrounding that, Chris? Yeah, does the notice to strike can be given within the 21 day cooling off period. It's there seems to be a common misconception that if we're available to go on strike on the 16th, that we give it on that day and then we have to wait 72 hours further. That that is not the case. We can give that 72 hours notice to strike within the 21 day cooling off period. All right. Uh, The next one we have. Will the company proactively cancel flights on the 15th or a day before the strike to avoid stranding aircrafts in other countries? Possibly they would have management pilots bring the tails home to protect the schedule until the last hour. Chris? Yeah, I mean, it's a valid question. I think we're playing the what if game at that point, Des. Uh, What will the company do? I mean, our company is different than any other company, I think, in a lot of ways. So will they preemptively cancel things if christmas is a tell they possibly might right they, they seen a storm coming there was some snowflakes near and they decided to cancel a whole bunch of flights with a strike likely that's their plan i don't think they want to strand airplanes and i think they know that we are serious that when we give strike notice that we will be willing to take strike action right and equally importantly for us uh, we need to remember that up until the point that a strike is called we operate the aircraft safely and professionally as we always do yeah, you're, you're right, Des. And part, I want to chime in on part of that because I think some of our pilots are anticipating that strike. They're anticipating, hey, on the 16th, this is happening. And a big part of this is exactly what you said is don't anticipate, don't assume, show up to work until you get that notification that we will communicate to you that, hey, the strike is on. You are not to continue. You follow the strike QRH as per the flow chart and make your decision from that point. That's exactly correct, Chris. Uh, as professional Alpha pilots, we have to ensure that our safety is held to the highest standard and we act as professionals throughout this. So we don't do anything until we hear news from the MEC. So here's a scenario. What if you were in the simulator in the middle of a sim session and say the strike was called at that time? How would you respond to that? Is there anything in the QRH that uh, touches on that, Christina? There is. If you go to the QRH, it's going to give you a very specific answer for your scenario. But the short answer is, if you are in SIM and you are mid-training, you as one of our members are to finish that session. If it's the first session of a SIM training event, once that session is over, you then take your bags and leave the building. However, if you're on an initial course, as a new hire pilot, the rules are a little bit different for you. And the intention is that if your instructor is possibly scabbing and still training you, then you must stay and continue your initial training until you have the PPC. And Christina, you say scabbing. As far as instructor, what does that mean? Like, obviously, it's a negative connotation. 
uh, are you saying that instructors should not be continuing training initial pilots? Uh, correct. If you're if you are a sim instructor and we are on strike, you are a scab if you are still continuing to do your job by training any WestJet pilots. That makes or, sense. Or swoop pilots. Yeah, totally. Okay, this next question pertains to the picketing event on May 8th. Uh, this person is wondering, if I'm on reserve on May 8th, can I still attend the picketing event, assuming that I'm not called out? Yes, obviously you can. Uh, what you do on your own time or on, while you're on reserve is up to you. You just have to be prepared to show up for an assignment that they may issue you. So we would suggest if you're going to attend the picket, come with your bags as if you're ready to go to work. And if you get called out at some point in that time uh, d during the picket, you have two hours to get to work. So you can definitely come to the picket and participate. Uh, here's a topic that needs some definition. It's the definition of struck work. So what is the definition of struck work? Des, the way the MEC defines struck work is any movement of an aircraft, any flying of an aircraft that is identified by the WestJet MEC as a traditional WestJet mainline or swoop route. So here's one. Now this person says, I live in Victoria. In the event of a strike, will I be able to do picketing actions in my home base? I think it's actually going to be an expectation that you pick it in your home base. If we have any concern about scab pilots potentially crossing a picket line to pick up any of our flying that might depart from some of the smaller airports in this country, such as Victoria, Kelowna, Thunder Bay, Ottawa, I mean, the list goes on, East Coast, Halifax, St. John's, uh, we will very much expect you to pick it. And if you are not picketing, then we will expect that all members that are not flying during a strike are answering phone calls and reaccommodating other members to get home. This one says, if we give strike notice and the company gives lockout notice on the 13th, are we on strike or are we locked out on the 16th? Des, that one comes down to a timeline. So essentially the first party to put in their notice will be the one that will be locking out and or striking. So if we get our notice in before the company, technically we're on strike. If they can get their notice in uh, to the CIRB before us, then we will be locked out at that time. Okay, sticking with the topic of the lockout. Yeah. In the event of a lockout, will we still get strike pay? Uh, absolutely does, yeah. A lockout is treated the exact same way as strike pay. So when you see the communication uh, regarding the eligibility for our pilots and strike pay, that will apply to a lockout situation. The last one we have here today. Uh, with management announcing that they are expecting to close the Sunwing deal any day now, would they theoretically be able to operate all WestJet flights on Sunwing Metal? So the last I heard, Des, is they have 19 aircraft. Ten of those are already called for over in Europe for the summer months. The other nine are, are uh, preloaded for southern flights out of, out of uh, Calgary going down south. So, no, they will not be able to replace the 106 WestJet planes and 16 swoop planes um, to replace our, our network. That last question is one that I hear a lot, and it, I think it's very important that you put it into context there, Bernie, with the actual... Uh, reality or possibilities of, of those things happening and the restrictions that actually exist just due to the number of airplanes that are physically available to do the flying that's available. It's concerning. I get that, Des. Yes, once again, the questions are important. We like to see them to continue to come in. There's actually a specific DART channel that's available to get these questions answered. We'd like to have them come in, have them incorporate into uh, future podcasts. So again, everybody, thank you very much for listening. And remember... Stay informed, read your communications, stay engaged, wear your lanyards, show your support, and most importantly, please stay safe. Thanks again for listening to this edition of the WestJet Pilots Podcast.